Hello everyone, welcome to our online discussion on the worldwide spread of disinformation during the coronavirus pandemic. We started with a little delay because we are still waiting for our third speaker, but I'm just going to start and maybe she will join us in a couple of minutes. So my name is Zora Siebert and I'm the head of EU policy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is a political foundation with close ties to the German Green Party. We conduct and support civic educational activities with over 30 offices worldwide. We are very proud to host this event today jointly with the EU DisinfoLab, an independent nonprofit organization focused on tackling sophisticated disinformation campaigns targeting the EU, its member states, institutions, and call core values. Please note that this event will be recorded. After my short introduction, our speakers will give inputs on how their regions or countries deal with coronavirus related disinformation. Then we will get into a discussion. My colleague, Joan Lanfranco, our communication and outreach coordinator, will then take over for the questions from the audience. If you have questions, please submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please mention if you want to address your, your question to a specific speaker or to the whole panel. And please also say if you would like to stay anonymous. For us at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, it is the second event of our own Tech and COVID-19 series, which is a joint project between our offices in Brussels, Washington DC and Hong Kong. These online discussions track the topics of our article series Tech and COVID-19, which you will find on the Foundation's website, so stay tuned. In this session, we will talk about narratives of coronavirus-related disinformation around the world. In the latest piece for the Tech and COVID-19 series, Ellen P. Goodman and Karen Kornblue, who is also a speaker today, discuss that platforms should implement a circuit breaker mechanism to limit the exponential amplification of harmful content. Another author, Jean de Dieu, Sirigiri sheds a light on the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the challenge over there is to convince people that coronavirus exists. Christy Tsang analyzed for Tech and COVID-19 how fact-checking initiatives have been effective fighting COVID-19 disinformation. However, other tactics like confusing or overly broad laws could be used to maintain to maintain political power in Singapore and South Korea. How do we deal with disinformation that crosses national borders? Where do the stories come from? How do they spread and what is their purpose? What can democracies do about this? What should companies do? What can we all do? Today, we are trying to find answers to these important questions. Now, I'm very happy to introduce our great panelists across three time zones. So first of all, we have Roman Adamczyk, who is research coordinator at the EU Disinfo Lab. Roman holds a master's in geoeconomics and strategic intelligence from the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs in Paris and a master's in management from Grenoble School of Management. He joined EU Disinfo Lab in 2019. Then we will hear from Karen Kornblue, who is a senior fellow and director of the Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative at the German Marshall Fund for the United States. Karen Kornblue served as US ambassador for the OECD under President Barack Obama and as a senior official at the US Department of the Treasury and the Federal Communications Commission under President Bill Clinton. And last but not least, and I hope she will be able to join us, we will hear from Nanjala Niabola, who is a writer, political analyst and activist, activist based in Nairobi, Kenya. Nanjala Niabola writes extensively about African society and politics, technology, international law, and feminism. She is the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Kenya. With that, I would like to hand over to my co-host, Roman Adamczyk, for his first input. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Zora. And um, on behalf of the UDs Info Lab, I would like to say that um, we are really happy to co-host this event uh, with your foundation, especially in this, uh, in this very challenging time uh, in terms of disinformation and the fight of disinformation. For us, it's really important 
to to take times to exchange views and to try to have a global overview uh, of the situation to be able then to find solution. So let me share my screen. And could you could you please mute yourself for a second and and then unmute because I, we have a bit of a microphone problem. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? I think it's better. Yeah, I think it's better. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Yeah. No, maybe you can see my screen now. No, no, it's not really better. Could you could you plug uh, plug in and out? Or plug out and in. <laughs> uh, uh, Not, not really. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, try to activate somehow. Again, your microphone. Okay, so I think now it's a connection problem because his screen is stuck. Might have been a problem with his connection. Let's wait a bit. Ah, he's back. Really sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, somehow it's it's more or less fine. <laughs> I'm uh, really sorry. A Belgium connection connections are not always that good, so I will try to go back to sharing my screen. Let's hope it will work a bit better now. So yes, I think one, uh, oops, sorry. Everything is a bit slow today. I think one, uh, one important thing, uh, especially, in, uh, especially in this uh, challenging time with the infodemic, to really understand the situation is first to, is first to go back uh, to go back to uh, definitions and really to try to uh, first think of what is the disinformation and misinformation ecosystem. So first, and uh, what is important, uh, what is uh, for me especially important in this time of crisis, is to see that uh, during the infodemic, uh, there is both misinformation and disinformation which are, which are spread. So as you can see here, uh, the definition from uh, first draft news, really the big, uh, the big difference between misinformation and disinformation is that with, misinformation, with disinformation, there is really a deliberate uh, attempt to mislead people when with misinformation, it is, it is more mistake or people who are, who are going to share false information, but unintentionally. And this is really important because during the, during the infodemic, uh, what, what we have seen so far is often more misinformation than disinformation. The other important thing to, to keep in mind with disinformation, it's um, that uh, contrary to to sometimes the the image that uh, we are we we have of uh, for example hackers from um, hackers in Russia trying to spread uh, false information, uh, the picture is often much more much more complex, 
with really a lot of motives and a lot of different actors uh, which, are, which, are, which are spreading this information. In the, in the UD's Info Lab, we tried to, to, give a, to give a picture with a piece called The Few Faces of This Information. And for us, there is really four types of, uh, of bin motives. So there is, a, there is foreign influence. It's, uh, it's often the most known with uh, country, countries trying to use this information to influence the political situation in another country. You have uh, the political disinformation, which is, which can be, which is often, uh, which which is those those domestic, with people trying to influence uh, domestic audience with uh, with uh, disinformation. Lucrative, it's actors who are going to who are going to uh, use this information for profit. And there are much more, there are a lot of uh, this kind of actors. And issue base, it's when, uh, it's when people uh, and actors are going to spread this information from, uh, from a very, for, for advancing a very specific agenda. Uh, for example, uh, during the infodemic, you have, uh, you have all the anti-vax movements, uh, which is going to use this information to really uh, on this specific issue of vaccine. And also one, uh, one important thing to understand is that this motive uh, is that uh, you can't always, for one actor spreading this information, you can have a bit of all these motives. So, so the picture can be, can be quite complex and so what uh, when we are when we are talking about the infodemic oops sorry uh, i will try to go back when we are when, when we are talking about the infodemic uh, what is this situation and why we are talking about the infodemic? The first thing which is important to understand is that with the coronavirus, especially at the beginning of the crisis, we had really a very, very big uh, period of uncertainty. And every time you have a, you have a period of uncertainty, it's, it's really the situation where this information is going to to flourish everywhere because people people want to want to know what is happening and and with the the COVID nineteen we didn't have the we didn't have uh, the answer and we still haven't all the answers yet and this uncertainty is also it's also uh, a big factor for the spreading of misinformation uh, with people. Uh, who are going to who are going to to make claims which can't be proved yet, and uh, which are going to be sometimes false, and so this is uh, one important factor. The other important factor it's really simple, but but COVID nineteen is, is a situation which is impacting everyone. So then you can uh, you can have uh, you can have uh, your family spreading this information. You have every actor. That it's not only, for example, a political topic. So everyone uh, is looking for information and is sharing information. And uh, the last important factor is also that it is a global issue. And with a global issue, you can have global narratives and this information being spread in multiple countries at the same time. So as you can see, uh, the infodemic, uh, there is really big factors which explain why we, we are in a, in a context of an infodemics. It's that really you have all the factors possible to, uh, to help people spread this information and to create, uh, to create really a global disinformation storm. And so uh, in, in Europe, especially because the EU Disinfo Lab is working uh, 
he was working more specifically on uh, monitoring disinformation in European countries. The first thing we we have seen since the beginning of the of the infodemic is, of course, a high level of disinformation uh, circulating online. The the second thing is that, um, uh, contrary to uh, to something. Uh, to something because we are we are thinking of the infodemic as a specific uh, of as a specific situation. We, we could have think that there are really specific narratives spread during this uh, this crisis. And what I want to say is that it's not really the case. It's more people adapting adapting uh, all, all our classic gives to the COVID-19 situation. So for example, all the, all the anti-experts narratives uh, were, were there uh, way before the, the COVID-19 crisis, but they were adapted to target doctors, to target uh, authorities. Uh, one also good example is how during the infodemic, uh, we have seen uh, we have seen uh, in Europe narrative narrative targeting Bill Gates uh, the same way as for other topics they, they are targeting more George Soros with conspiracy theories so you have really uh, a similar pattern here to build the conspiracy theories around uh, some specific uh, against specific uh, public figures. One important thing with the infodemic is also what we have seen, it's really an increase of the spread of this information in multiple platforms, uh, especially, um, for example, uh, in France, uh, we, we didn't see before a lot of this information being spread on WhatsApp. And since the beginning of the COVID-19, uh, WhatsApp has been uh, has been uh, an important platform now in France to amplify this information. The other the other thing we we observed in Europe it's really uh, a growing success for some uh, some uh, already established uh, actors, local and uh, local in, and international, which means that for example. Uh, in Italy, uh, what we what we have observed is that the anti-vax movement, which was uh, already there and quite present online, really used the crisis to to multiply uh, its uh, its audience. One one other phenomenon is like uh, the QAnon movement, uh, which used the crisis uh, because QAnon so conspiracy theory movement more based in the US now with the with the covid crisis they used this crisis to spread their narratives and try to gain more audience in Europe and uh, one important characteristic uh, with the infodemic is that um, uh, we have uh, we have seen uh, real life consequences uh, very clearly with for example people burning uh, 5g towers in the in the uk or, or refusing to wear masks masks in multiple european country and uh, and this is quite uh, quite important because it uh, it shows very clearly what can be the impact of uh, this information and why we need to to have to we need to act to face uh, this kind of challenges and uh, and to con to conclude what i would say uh, is that uh, really the infodemic is a, it's a major challenge because everything in the disinformation ecosystem is getting bigger with more actors involved, uh, more actors gaining more audiences on multiple platforms. So it's really a big challenge, but it's also a good opportunity uh, because it, uh, it, uh, it created really uh, a sense of uh, 
it, it, it showed, it shows forms for authorities to act and uh, we will probably uh, discuss about it uh, more in the in the q a and uh, in the q a session but there is really there is really things now moving in the disinformation in the disinformation landscape to try to make things change to uh, to, to implement more regulations and things like that so so that was it for my part and uh, what i can say from the eu disinfo lab point of view what we observed during the infodemic thank you very much for this uh, insight roman um now i would like to pass the floor to our second speaker karen cornblue please go ahead karen Thank you, and thank you to the uh, Heinrich Boll uh, Foundation and EU Disinfo Lab. This is a great discussion. I'm so happy that you're organizing it and so happy to be part of it. Um, and I think um, uh, I, I will pick up exactly where Roman left off. You know, in the United States, the conversation has been really paralyzed <clears throat> because there's this false choice that we are all thinking that, that, that we are faced with, which is that it's either government censorship or we can't do anything, that those are our only two choices. And so in our program, the Digital Innovation uh, and Democracy Initiative with Ellen Goodman, we did a year long study to really understand the drivers of disinformation in the context of real policy solutions how could we how could we understand the problem in a way that there were sensible policy solutions um, and really updating offline policies for these online problems and while we can't solve everything that way there will still be some thorny issues that have to do with content what we found is that a lot of it we can we can pull away from the content and look at some other problems behind the actual content that is the issue so there's the problem of, for instance, runaway algorithms, an algorithm that is designed to keep you online, to keep you sharing, uh, because then you can be served ads. And these algorithms favor outrage, conspiracy theory, and they sp speed up things very quickly. There's the, what we call Trojan horse outlets, outlets that look like traditional journalism, but it really has nothing to do with what you would think of as traditional journalism. They don't tell you who's who's paying for them. They don't separate news from opinion. Um, they, uh, they repeatedly share false information. So these outlets that fool users into thinking, oh, this is just like the journalism I've always known, but in fact, it's a propaganda sheet or it's a political outlet. And then these extremist hate and repeat bad actor groups and channels that set up online um, either anti-vax or white supremacist, um, ones that are repeatedly sharing uh, disinformation or worse. Uh, and they are ready to amplify as well uh, some of these conspiracy theories. In the US especially, we have this problem of dark money, uh, of uh, people who are able to buy ads or um, fund these outlets without any transparency about who they are. There are a series of charities and corporate entities that don't have to reveal their source of funding. And then there's outright fraud. You know, there's like fraudulent buying of accounts. Um, there's bots. There's, um, there's selling um, uh, uh, products like um, cures uh, where people are just making money off of disinformation. So, so I'm gonna go into some of these, these issues, but um, I think the thing we have to keep our eye on is despite all the noise about what's going on, there's rampant disinformation right now online. So Avaz just came out with a study that showed that COVID disinformation has been seen over 3 billion times. Um, in the US, we had a, um, a, contro a controversial uh, supposed documentary that was pe peddling dangerous uh, public health claims. It went viral across Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. It was called the Plandemic. And it said that, you know, masks are bad for you. And, and Dr. Fauci, who's our uh, 
premier scientist is, um, is a fraud. It was viewed more than 8 million times in a week before YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter removed it for violating their policies. Then a few weeks later, just showing you how fast these things have accelerated, how much these have, have accelerated, another video entitled America's Frontline Doctors that peddled similar conspiracy theories um, was seen 20 million times in 12 hours. And, uh, and then it was taken down. So it clearly violated the terms of service of the major platforms because they eventually did take it down. But the amplification through groups, through these algorithms had sped up so much in a few weeks that whereas one was seen 8 million times, this was seen uh, 20 million times. Um, this video was produced with dark money. It was shared by these Trojan horse outlets. Um, it was promoted by highly influential accounts that repeatedly share disinformation, um, shared across large Facebook groups uh, like anti-vax groups and reopen groups uh, that are anti-government and advanced by algorithmic recommendations. Um, now the platforms have obviously taken more aggressive action against COVID than they have against other kinds of disinformation. Um, they're doing more takedowns and content labeling. Um, they're redirecting users. Uh, Facebook has set up an information center, but it's obviously not enough. So when we look at solutions, I'll just go through quickly some of the solutions that we've been thinking about. One, of course, and I'll just get this out of the way in the beginning is we need to do much better um, media uh, literacy, um, digital media literacy uh, in schools among, among older populations. I know that's already happening in Europe. Finland is really a model here. Uh, we also need to fund uh, good, good information and good journalism. So we've been talking about uh, PBS, which is you know, our public broadcasting service, that we need a PBS of the internet to publicly finance uh, good content uh, or good outlets and to ensure that uh, it's available. So public health information should be more easily available and pushed out. Um, and, and to pay for that, there should be a tax on online ad revenue um, because all the, the, that ad revenue supported journalism and now it's moved online. Um, obviously the platforms should decide, design feeds to prioritize good information. So all of that, what, what my colleague uh, Ellen Goodman has said is boost the signal, boost the signal of the good information. But what do we do about the noise? How do we dampen the noise of the disinformation? So as, as you said, we wrote a piece last week that we need to build in friction to combat these runaway algorithms. So platforms need a mechanism that will stop the viral spread of disinformation, of potential disinformation, potential harmful information, at least until there has been careful consideration of whether it violates their terms of service or poses a harm. And they have to do some kind of risk-based analysis. They can't always uh, bias, lean in the direction of it must stay up, it must stay up until we're absolutely sure it has to come down. When we're in the middle of a pandemic, in the US we're approaching an election, um, racial strife is on the increase, there has to be a sense that if something is runaway train and it has the potential to be harmful, we're going to pause the spread of it. We're not gonna take it down. We're gonna stop the spread of it and take a look uh, and see what to do. These Trojan horse outlets and the extremist uh, and dangerous groups need to be taken down. There needs to be much more vigilance about going after not just the, you know, Facebook has taken more action to um, privilege uh, trusted sources, but there are still terribly disinforming sites that lack all kinds of transparency about who they are, who's paying for them, who's writing their pieces, um, and uh, that, you know, that have repeatedly offended, uh, been repeat offenders of disinformation, and they're still up. There has to be a much less tolerance for these Trojan horse outlets for groups um, you know, the QAnon groups are now coming down, but they were allowed to stay up way too long. The anti-vax groups were allowed to stay up way too long. Uh, we found a bunch of health and wellness sites, uh, supposed health and wellness sites that were spreading um, all these quack cures 
And they have now, as Roman was saying, they have now fed into the QAnon process, fed into the reopen process. They shouldn't have been up there. They were peddling disinformation. Um, in the US, we need to update our civil rights laws uh, for the online environment. Um, and there needs to be much better cross-platform information sharing on bad actors and on fraud. Um, and that needs to be with law enforcement and with, um, and with intelligence. So we're not talking about uh, uh, anything that there aren't laws about in the offline world, you know, um, uh, but, but we need to be more aggressive about going after them. And the platforms need codes of conduct that are accountable uh, for dealing with all this, for dealing with this really risky activity. And by accountable, what I mean is, Right now, it's very hard for anyone on the outside to know what's going on, to monitor or audit. In the aftermath of the 2016 election, when we knew that the Russians had interfered, the only way we got data and could understand what had happened was that our Senate Intelligence Committee had to really compel the platforms to give up this data. And then we did studies and we found out, for instance, how they'd organized competing rallies of pro-Muslim and anti-Muslim people, how they had targeted African-Americans, how they'd set up fake Black Lives Matter accounts. We would not have known that if the platforms weren't compelled to release that data. And the platforms realized that. Facebook announced at a hearing in Congress that they were going to share data with a bunch of social science researchers. Um, and it really hasn't proven fruitful. They've never figured out how to do that. So. There are a lot of issues of intellectual property and privacy and so on that have to be solved, but these need to be solved. And this data needs to be available to researchers. And then there needs to be some kind of independent monitoring or auditing to find out what's going on, how are their terms of service being enforced and applied, uh, and what's going on with these runaway algorithms. So these are just some of the ideas we have, but just in summation, what I wanna say is just, I don't want us to be stuck in this false choice that the only way to combat the very serious issues that Ramon talked about and that Nigel is gonna talk about is government censorship. That's not true. We have rules for the offline world and a lot of those can be updated for this dangerous online world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank you very much, Roman. We still haven't heard from Nanjala yet. I think it might be due to connection issues in Nairobi because we had some problems yesterday when we did a test call. So. We are still hopeful that we, she will join us, but we just continue our discussion without her for now. And if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A at the bottom. And yeah, so uh, Roman and Karen, you were both going into the, um, what can we do about it? There are already existing laws that can regulate some of the issues that we encounter online. But to be honest, for now, in Europe, we were using the self-regulatory approach for social networks, for example, and that hasn't really worked yet in the last years. And in Europe, there's a big reform coming up who might deal with that, the Digital Services Act. But in your point of view, what could be a good regulatory approach? Maybe, Karen, do you want to start? And then Roman? Um. Sure. One of the things that I think is being discussed in Europe is this really important idea of speech versus reach, that we don't want to keep people from speaking on what have become the public square of these platforms, but that doesn't mean that you have a right to reach, that you don't, you have a right to be amplified, to be seen by everybody, um, in fact, to be boosted, the more conspiratorial, the more outlandish your claim. And this is something that Renee Jaresta, who's now at Stanford, has talked about. Um, so that's where we came up with this idea of the circuit breaker, that let's not give it reach. We don't have to take away the speech, but let's not give it reach until we've seen it. Um, but I think, I think even beyond that, um, we need to, we really need to look at some of these entities that are parked online, that are ready to boost this misinformation. Um, and there's been very unequal um, uh, application of the terms of service we know to many of the outlets that are, are bad actors. Um, and I, I, I just think that we're getting into the, to the land of fraud, uh, extremism, uh, um, hate crimes, and there just needs to be more activity 
um, updating of consumer protection laws, um, pressure on the platforms to be more transparent about how they deal with these really bad actors that repeatedly offend, that are putting out dangerous information before they become public health threats and public safety threats. There needs to be, people talk about transparency as a solution, but I don't think they're radical enough. I think we need much more radical transparency on this dark, these dark money groups um, and on the kind of fraud that's able to occur online. Uh, the, the, the internet was supposed to be this great transparency mechanism. Transparency is a foundational value of the internet, and yet it is enabling all kinds of trickery and fraud, and we, we cannot tolerate that anymore. So those are the, the big things that I would focus on. Thank you, Karen. Take it away, Roman. <laughs> from, a, from a point of view, uh, there, is, yeah, there is still a, a lot to do. But first, I think one thing we, we have to keep in mind, which is a really important, is that we are, we are currently facing, uh, for, for several years now, a global crisis of uh, trust uh, uh, connected to governments, to institutions. And uh, it's, it's also important, especially uh, as we have seen when, during the infodemic, uh, a lot of uh, countries trying to, to impose their narratives using uh, influence and disinformation to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to be there and to spread their messages. This old climate, climate of this trust for me, the feeling is that we, even if governments need to do much better, we need also to think of a global response involving uh, civil society with, for example, more funding for NGOs, for, for journalism, I think it's also something extremely, extremely important because uh, as my, uh, as our, as the head of uh, the EU Disinfo Lab likes to say, it's really, it's really cheap to spread disinformation and it's really expensive to, to counter it. Uh, this is my, uh, this was my first point. Then I, I would like to say that uh, one, one uh, big challenge for me is that uh, for now disinformation, we are, to, we are thinking a lot about it from a platform's point, point of view view but there is a lot of things happening with this website like uh, Karen uh, uh, talked about with all these media outlets uh, we don't know where they are aff uh, their affiliation their political affiliation they can be used for money for money to uh, for foreign interference to spread also extremist ideas and all this ecosystem for now, in terms of regulation, there is um, there is pretty much uh, nothing really done. Uh, for example, we can think about how uh, if uh, if uh, we made uh, the EU Disinfo Lab a big investigation uh, two months ago about a website connected to the Russian intelligence. And uh, one one idea maybe could be to say that this uh, the pro the hosting provider of uh, of this website should ban them, and if they don't, there might be sanction from from the European institution. So there is also all this ecosystem to we really need to think about, and. Uh, and the last point I would say it's uh, it's still platform and uh, accountability. It's always uh, one of the most uh, uh, topics uh, which is coming back, but uh, it's really important. For example, we made uh, some uh, investigation showing that uh, uh, that websites uh, uh, posing as media were connected to extremist groups. And, uh, and they were able to stay on Facebook without any consequences. So why, why uh, should, is it normal? I don't know because there is also, we need always to be a bit careful with, uh, with the issue of freedom of speech. But at one point when people are pretending to be media but don't want to be transparent about their identity, 
responding them how what is the uh, what is the, what are their connection with uh, political groups and political parties you have a, you have an issue there and for me platforms should act thank you very much roman and now we already have a couple of questions so i hand over to my colleague joan thank you sora and uh, hello everyone uh, we have a very engaged audience with many interesting questions. Uh, so I will uh, please our, uh, ask our speakers to, to be uh, brief so we can address as many uh, questions as possible. So I will start first uh, with a question from Inga, which is addressed to both uh, of you. Uh, so uh, which countries uh, globally you see as countering uh, these, uh, these information threats uh, more effectively? And uh, what factors do you think determine their success? So if you want Karin to start and then Roman, very briefly. Sure, I'll be interested to hear what Roman says because the first two that come to my mind are Estonia and Finland for different reasons. And I think one of the challenges we're having in the US as opposed to like Estonia, where Estonia it was a very much seen as a foreign threat, was a threat from Russia. Whereas here in the US, I don't think we paid enough attention to it because of our free speech um, concerns, legitimate concerns, we didn't really pay attention until it until after the election when it became a partisan political issue inside the US and very hard to talk about, as opposed to Estonia where they saw it as pure as you know, dangerous, public safety, external threat, and they acted on it um, with with uh, education and information and tools and, and action. And then in Finland, as I said, they've had a really similar situation, uh, external threat, and they've been very focused on educating, again, really educating in the schools, educating their population about how to be more skeptical, uh, how to pay attention to what's online. Um, and then, I, you know, obviously what's happening in Germany is really interesting, and I haven't studied it enough. Um, it doesn't apply as easily to the US, um, again, because of our First Amendment issues. But because of their history, I think there's been a much lower tolerance for the extremism. And I'd be, I'd be, I, I really would like to study that more and to see. Um, I think we have some concerns in the US that may be, um, uh, things may be taken down too quickly, that it may interfere with freedom of expression, that it, there may be a, a disproportionate impact on certain communities of a very fast takedown requirement. Um, but I think it's it's it, we should be studying it to learn what we can what we can replicate and what we can't replicate. Thanks, Karen. Roman, would you add, would you like to add anything? Uh, from my side, I would, from my point of view, I would say also a bit the same with uh, the country in Scandinavia and uh, Eastern Europe because of the they are much more aware of uh, what is disinformation and what uh, disinformation can do. But uh, I don't want to, to give a too depressing uh, answer, but uh, I'm afraid that, uh, especially from a government point of view, a lot uh, and from, uh, in a lot of countries where we are only starting to really understand that uh, disinformation is not only about uh, geopolitics, about Russia, Russia or China, and uh, and uh, now we are we are only really starting now since uh, we have been start we we have started since uh, several months I think to to really to really go really into the topic and try to find more global solutions for all the challenges. Thank you. Our next question from Oren says, uh, speech versus reach is an excellent approach, but asks, how can this be sold to the platforms when it directly affects their business model? Karen, which, or uh, Roman, would you like to? Uh, that, uh, uh, I don't, to be honest, uh, to be honest, I don't have really a, an answer to that because, uh, yeah, it's really com complicated to make uh, to make platforms move, at least from my point of view and from from a European point of view. 
So it's really, it's really more like, uh, for me, like Karen said, uh, with uh, accountability, it's one way maybe to have uh, things change. And also, I think a civil society can uh, can have a role on uh, on this topic, uh, showing uh, showing why the platform, uh, why the business current business model of the platform can be dangerous to counter this information, and how to and uh, to propose solution to make them move. But uh, yeah, it's really big entities, so it's. Uh, it's quite a challenge from my point of view. Yeah, the, the thing I would say is, and this is why a place like the Disinfo Lab, EU Disinfo Lab is so important, is people don't understand how these algorithms work. And you know, often they think that what they see in their newsfeed is just the most recent thing that their friend posted or the most true thing. And until people really understand, I don't think there's gonna be enough pressure on the platforms because as you say, there, or as the questioner says, their business model is to keep you online and to keep you upset and to keep you, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know masks could make COVID worse. Let me share that with all my friends uh, until they realize that the, that the interests of the platform may differ from their own interests and, and how the algorithm works. There's not gonna be enough pressure on the platforms. And a lot of people are saying, in the US are wondering if the business model of the platforms is just completely in conflict with democracy. And, and if that questioning really starts, I think, you know, hopefully the platforms will say, you know, we have to be more serious, we have to take greater action. But until there's more understanding and much more accountability and transparency uh, so that folks can see what they really are doing versus the press releases, uh, I don't think we'll have that that pressure. Thanks, Karen. Uh, your last point links uh, with a question on the individual responsibility when facing misinformation. So Fateme is asking if there are uh, fundamental actions to be taken uh, to contract uh, this information and how can we uh, react and counter once we face these situations on a, on a daily basis? Mm. So, Roman or Karen? <laughs> uh, me, I think, uh, from a, from a, an individual point of view, uh, even if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, sometimes a, a bit uh, upsetting or tiring, simple actions like uh, like uh, if you are seeing one disinformation. Um, when this information online and posting posting on the comment section that this is not true and trying to to explain the the situation uh, this is uh, this is one thing which is important because uh, for example uh, if your um, fact checkers are always going to tell you to have a look at uh, uh, at uh, at the comment sections uh, to see if uh, people are people if there is no contradiction to the to this information, then also to follow follow fact checking organizations uh, and uh, even share sometimes their work uh, from uh, an individual point of view. It's a small action, but uh, which can be useful for me. Thank you. Karen, would you like to add anything? Well, the only thing I would say is I feel like there aren't really enough. I feel like it's really um, not fair to ask individuals to do this by themselves, which I know isn't what the questioner meant or what Rama meant at all. But, but I feel like often uh, from public officials, that's what the message will be is, you know, you should, you should be more aware, you should, but there aren't enough tools really on the It's very, very difficult to know. I mean, even, even a very respected news outlet when you see it online you don't know if that's an opinion piece or a news piece so then you think oh they're so biased because you don't you know things are really disintermediated online there's not an, you if you pick up a newspaper in in the old days you could open it up and you could see the masthead that would tell you who owns it and who publishes it and um you know you would know that they had codes and standards 
online, when you see a news item that looks like a news item, you really don't know any of that information or even if they have a masthead. So that's just one example. Um, the user interface is designed to take your personal information, perform an experiment on you, target you, and you have no idea you, how would you know that uh, it's, it's happening behind the screen. So um, it's almost like we are uh, rats in a lab experiment and we are not aware of it. So I think that's why I say radical transparency because it's extremely hard right now with the signals that people get because of the, 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 the user interface is really makes it very easy for manipulation and very hard for individual users who are trying to protect themselves. And it's, it's, it's really unfair um, situation right now. We need, to, we need to make that more equal. Thanks to both. Uh, next and last question uh, is uh, related to e-health and how it uh, it's related to um, well to the COVID crisis. Um, specifically, Joe is asking how can trust in the government and on uh, e-health, so governmental health institutions, can be reestablished in the in the, the midst of this uh, crisis. Who would like to reply to that one? Uh, since I was so pessimistic, I'll just say one thing um, to be positive, which is, again, I think there's more that government can do to, to get out accurate information, accurate you know, tools that are useful. I think this whole debate about the testing and tracing apps has been really useful because um, people are thinking about you know, what kind of telehealth information is okay, what kind of privacy protections do we need. You know, this is you know, th this should be what we're, what we're using uh, digital technology for, uh, as opposed to reading conspiracy theories. So I, I do think there's a big future in that, but governments have to become much more um, aware, and not only governments, public health officials, uh, doctors, just need to become much more comfortable with the digital environment and much better about using it uh, and providing people uh, access to tools and information. And uh, if I can add, uh, I would say uh, this is also important for 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 official and governments to really improve their understanding of uh, how the disinformation ecosystem work, and really to be to have a communication more transparent and more more precise, and also. Uh, also, even if uh, it's a bit complicated because politically people, uh, people want uh, sometimes fast to have answers uh, really quickly, uh, you have to, to make people understand that information. It's not because, because you have a lot of things online that you are going to have the good information right away in front of you. So you need uh, to... Uh, you, there, you, you need more time sometimes to really get to the bottom of uh, what is happening, especially with the pandemic. Thank you very much, Karen and, and Roman for your, re for your replies and also to our audience for their insightful questions. So now it's back to Zora. Thanks a lot to all of you. So I think these were really interesting perspectives from the US and from the EU on what governments can do, what kind of responsibility uh, companies should take, also what we as individuals can do. And I also want to thank you for your replies and for the questions from the audience. Mm, maybe to wrap it up, as you mentioned, Karen, the internet was imagined as this giant, you know, sharing of knowledge and democratization of knowledge as well and information. But we realized over the years that it also amplified misinformation and disinformation. So this is kind of the dark side of this beautiful technology utopia we imagined. And it's threatening our democracies and nowadays in the pandemic also, unfortunately, also our health. Um, I wanted to ask what we can do on the individual level, but this question was already asked by the audience. So um, I'll wrap it up here and I uh, thank you very much for your participation. Unfortunately, we didn't have Nanjala with us, but maybe this could be for another time because I guess we will deal with disinformation 
for a little longer. So thanks a lot to everybody and have a wonderful day and afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Zaha.